Okay, so we're on lab 11, um, reproductive cycle and development. So I'm gonna to toggle a little bit back and forth. This is easy enough to fill out. I'm gonna go back and forth between my PowerPoint, which I think is gonna be easier for you to understand and then how that overlaps into this, these exercises. So uh, let's just start by um, doing the matching of hormone functions. And remember that because these are uh, some of these present in men, um, then um, we'll often refer to uh, within the function, you know, something about how it, what it does in males, so that you're kind of connecting it still. Uh, this does refer to a large extent back to the last lesson that we performed in the reproduction lab. It showed kind of that flow chart from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary, the arrows, you know, and you're writing hormones over the arrows or the, the uh, FSH and F, the you know, acronyms for uh, the hormones. So now we're giving a little bit more function to it, especially when it comes to females. So A, stimulates the development of ovarian follicles, stimulates meiosis in males and females. That would be FSH. Right? So A is FSH. Stimulates the release of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary. That would be GNRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. See a massive release of this hormone causes the follicle to rupture and expel the secondary oocyte. In males, don't forget, this hormone targets the interstitial cells in the testes to secrete testosterone. So that would be luteinizing hormone, LH. Okay, then D, repairs endometrium by increasing mitosis. Ding, ding, ding. Also stimulates the development of female secondary sec uh, sexual characteristics, the fat tissue and breast tissue. That would be estrogen. And then lastly, E, stimulates secretions in the uterus after ovulation. It also uh, feeds back to inhibit FSH and LH, any further secretions. It also stimulates an endometrium you know, the increased vascularization of that endometrium. And that would be progesterone. So E is progesterone. Okay, then we move on to exercise two. And this is a little bit easier to see when we're looking at some of the quickie sheet models, you know, but I'm gonna to toggle now back to where this information comes from in a chart form. Because what we're doing is we're looking at the days of a female cycle, which are generally days one through 28. So event dates over on the left-hand side in that vertical column, days one through five, six to 13, 14 and 15 to 28. The first day is always the first day of a menstrual cycle or a bleed. So we're gonna look at what, you know, what's going on in the ovaries during those days, one through five, you know, about the first week, the second week, one day, day 14, and then the last two weeks of a cycle. And what stage are the oocytes in? Uh, we can also write in there, you know, what is the hormone associated with this phase? Then we have uterine phases. We're going to look at what we call um, uterine phase and the hormone associated with it, days one through five, six through 13, and then 15 to 28. Day 14 is essentially just an ovarian event of ovulation. Not that the, the uterus doesn't have a day 14, but there is no particular um, phase you know, associated with that when it comes to the uterus. Okay, so let me stop my share and kind of switch over to, hopefully it's still there. Of course it isn't. All right, so let me do that. Okay. Mm -mm. Now try to reshare. There we go. And this is from the notes, right? This is from the PowerPoint up there. So you can use this as a reference also. This is about the male hormones. <clears throat> Excuse me. Female hormones, including prolactin and oxytocin. And then we have our phases. All right. So here we have um the event the ovarians first okay so we have day one through five is considered the follicular phase and day six through 13 is follicular phase 
Day 14 is an ovulatory event. So it just happens one day. That's that luteinizing hormone surge. And then from days 15 to 28 till essentially the end of the cycle in the ovaries, it's a luteal phase. All right, so just to keep in mind, here in the ovaries, right, these are the targets of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So what hormone is associated with the follicular phase? FSH, that's why we call it a follicular phase. And for days six through 13, it's an ovarian phase follicular because you know the primary hormone is FSH. Then we have a luteinizing hormone surge in ovulatory stage. So at day 14, luteinizing hormone and the last two weeks, 15 to 28, days 15 to 28, luteinizing hormone. That's why we call it a luteal phase. It's telling you essentially what hormone. So we have FSH, FSH through days uh, one through 13, luteinizing hormone and luteinizing hormone for days 14 through 28. Right, so what phase or, or what kind of follicle and oocyte? you know, do we have during about that first week of a female cycle? And it's the primary oocyte primary follicle. Then that completes meiosis one, enters meiosis two, remember, and then it halts in meiosis two until it's fertilized, right? So days six through 13 is a secondary oocyte or mature follicle. It then ruptures so really, if we follow the oocyte, it's still a secondary oocyte, but that one day, it's just considered a ruptured follicle. You know, and now we have that secondary oocyte with the cumulus oophorus around it, traveling in the fallopian tube. So what remains in the follicle, the post-ovulatory phases of days 15 to 28, it, the portions of that secondary or mature follicle that remain behind is the corpus luteum, and of course, the secondary follicle has been ovulated. And, and there's a, uh, sorry about the typo there. It says Ben like B-E-N instead of B-E-E-N. That must be why the spell check never picked it up. And I just noticed that now, so my bad. So the portion that stays behind in the ovary is the corpus luteum. And then of course we've ovulated the secondary oocyte and waiting to be fertilized in the fallopian tube. The uterine phases over on the right-hand side. So days one through five is menses, right? That, this is what's happening in the uterus. The female is menstruating. Then you complete menstruation in about five days. And then days six through 13, and really through day 14, is proliferation. So now that you've exfoliated, essentially, the surface of the endometrium has shed, it needs to replace itself. So we have a high, a, a period of time of high mitotic division, pro-life, proliferation, increasing in numbers right, due to estrogen targeting the endometrium and increasing the mitotic rate. Once we get to about day 15 through day eight, you know, 28, that's our secretory phase. That is progesterone, All right? That is mostly progesterone. So now we're increasing that thickness, we're engorging it with blood vessels in the event that we have fertilization implantation. We want to have a blood supply there, you know, for the, um, the blastocyst to bore into, into that surface, surface and then very quickly be able to establish a maternal side of the placenta and a fetal side of the placenta to nourish. I don't ask you over on the far left-hand side, the menstrual phase, pre-ovulatory, I mean, ovulation, you should know. You should definitely know ovulation. It's a 14, you know, only occurs at day 14. But the rest of that, I don't ask. They, you will have day numbers there, day one through five, six to 13, you know, maybe 14 and 15 to 28. Mm -hmm. So down below this <clears throat> is a one of those big cookie sheet models. That's why... Some of the pictures here are really good, right? In the center here of this cookie sheet model is the ovarian cycle going from A, B, C to D. And actually there really should be an E, there should be a corpus albicans here, a white body it's called. But we start with A, which is a primary 
follicle with the primary oocyte, and then turning into B, which is a secondary follicle with the secondary oocyte. B, you can see it maturing and developing that fluid-filled antrum there. It's getting large, about to rupture. Day 14 is this event here at C, you're ovulating. And then from C to D, and all the way to the other day, you know, um, is you know the days like 15 through 28, the end of the cycle, where we have the corpus luteum and it's secreting estrogen and progesterone. So events A through B up until about C is all follicle stimulating hormone, stimulating that process. Luteinizing hormone surges at C, where we're having um, ovulation, and then luteinizing hormone is stimulating the corpus luteum here. This phase is a D and D here, so to speak, you know, to keep producing estrogen and progesterone. If there's no implantation, that yellow body or, or corpus luteum becomes a white tissue called the corpus albicans. And this process begins and goes right back to A, B, C, D again. It cycles around and around and around. To the outer periphery, where you're looking at the uterus represents the uterine cycle, okay? The uterine cycle. And you can't see it on this model very well, but hopefully it'll get mag magnified a little bit later. And, you know, it tells you what days we're in. So it's just under, not that it really helps you right now, but if you go where the letter A is, to the upper right-hand corner, if you look at that uterus, just below that, under that, where the black magic marker wrote A and P, it should have days like one through five listed there. So there will be labels on here that tell you what day in the cycle, either in the ovarian cycle to the center or the uterine cycle to the outside that you're in. Okay. Here we are identifying our different hormones oxytocin, the production site, the target sites, of which there may be more than one, and the actions, prolactin, anti pituitary mammary glands, milk production, relaxin, produced by the placenta, targets two things, cervix and the, synthesis, and the pubic synthesis, dilates it, human chorionic gonadotropin, you know, comes from the placenta also, essentially, originally the trophoblastic cells that become the chorion, which becomes the fetal side of the placenta. Uh, targets the corpus medium to maintain the production of um, progesterone and estrogen, which maintains the endometrium of the uterus. Okay, so then we start looking at the model. So we're going to, I'm going to toggle back to you, the actual document we're working on and get, let's get that filled in. And I have to refresh it. So we're going. There we go. And back. There we go. All right. So now when we enter it, now you understand where we're coming from here. All right. So over on the left hand side, we just I just give you the dates because that eventually will match up eh, with um, those cookie sheet models. So we have the follicular um, ovarian phases first of um, follicular, then follicular. And then we have ovulation and luteal. Ovulation is day 14 and luteal is 15 to 28. What are the hormones? FSH, FSH, LH at day 14, and then LH from 15 to 28. All right. Our cycle, our ovaries, or follicles and oocytes, primary. Then we have uh, secondary or mature in day 16 to 13. 14 is ruptured, as we call it that. And then between 15 to 28, a secondary follicle, which has been ovulated and passing into the fallopian tube. And the portion that stays behind after ovulation is the corpus luteum. Okay, then our uterine phase is a little bit easier. We start with menses, day one through five. That's easy. 
Then we have proliferation and maybe write estrogen next to it because that's the primary hormone. And then uh, secretory phase, and then next to it, progesterone, the primary hormone. Right, so it says below that identify the stage that is ovulated. That is a secondary oocyte. Identify the following structures surrounding the oocyte, the corona radiata and the zona pellucida. You know, and what role of, um, what is the role of these structures during fertilization? So we're gonna look at um, one of those cookie sheet models. It looks like a great big, like a grapefruit size, um, ovulated secondary oocyte with the zona pellucida surrounding it in green. And then these cells, some of those follicular cells that go with it uh, and it helps protect it. So the corona radiata are these follicular cells, kind of looks like cotton candy the outside. You know, that helps prevent desiccation or the structure from drying out as it's passing down the fallopian tubes. It also creates a physical barrier to the sperm so that you kind of weed out the weak sperm and only the strong ones kind of get through, hopefully, that can actually reach the, reach <clears throat> the zona pellucida and produce fertilization. The zona pellucida is a membrane that surrounds the oocyte and it has receptors called ZP3 receptors, but receptors for the sperm to make contact with. And once one sperm interacts like that and binds with that receptor, you have what's called a kind of like a cortical reaction. You have a, a, an elevation and a space created between the plasma membrane of the oocyte and that zona pellucida. And some calcium and things gets uh, secreted into that region. So what it does is it creates kind of a, a, a hard barrier, calcified barrier around the oocyte so that other sperm can't penetrate and have what's called polysperm. So you want one sperm to get through you know, contribute his chromosomes and DNA and, and make it otherwise impermeable to other sperm. All right, so we'll look at those pictures in a minute. Then we're gonna look at <clears throat> these hormones. All right, so this is where the hormones of oxytocin, prolactin, relaxin, human chorionic, gonadotropin came in. <clears throat> it says using all available models as your guide as well, complete the chart describing the production site, target site, and actions of the hormones. So oxytocin, posterior pituitary, well, actually I take that back. The production site is the hypothalamus and it's stored and released from the posterior pituitary. Oxytocin targets the myometrium. So the, you know, the action next to that, I'd write in um, contraction of the muscle. And then oxytocin targets the mammary ducts for milk letdown. Okay, prolactin comes from the anterior pituitary, targets the mammary glands, milk production. Relaxin and HCG, you can write in there uh, placenta, because that's technically where it's just coming from. I'm not going to distinguish between, you know, um, you know whether it was, you know, Originally, the, the trophoblastic cells that became the cornea, which become the fetal side of the placenta. All right, so we have placenta for relaxin, production site, placenta for <clears throat> HCG. All right, relaxin, what does it target? It targets in pregnancy now, it targets the pubic synthesis, and the action is to relax the pubic synthesis. And then the second target is the cervix of the uterus and it too relaxes the cervix. Human chorionic gonadotropin targets the corpus luteum. LH is now no longer being released from the anterior pituitary, but we need to keep stimulating the corpus luteum to produce estrogen and progesterone so you don't enter into menses. So HCG targets the corpus luteum action, um, stimulate corpus luteum to produce estrogen and progesterone. That would be fine. And then we enter into our phases and our, our models and things. Right. So we have stages. We have these embryologic stages. The zygote, the morula, the blastocyst, three-week embryo, and then first month embryo. That's where I stop. All right. So those are the stages. We have events and processes associated with those. 
And you can see, it will identify those when you go from kind of stage to stage. Now, at certain intervals, like in the blastocyst stage, there are two regions that you need to identify, the trophoblast cells and the inner cell mass. And we said, describe here what, you know, each structure or layer, you know, what do they develop, you know, develop into? Because you start out with certain cells and they're gonna move and migrate and differentiate and start out, you know, by being, you know, just these cells that are part of the morula. And now they you know, move to an area, you know, and becomes now the inner cell mass, let's say. So the trophoblast in that blank, we're gonna write in there becomes the chorion and then maybe in parentheses, placenta, because that is eventually what it will become. So it initially is called the chorion, comes the chorionic villi, which are the blood vessels and the blood supply on the fetal side, and which is essentially the placenta of the fetus. The inner cell mass, that becomes the fetus. So keep in mind, when it, when it comes to the placenta, you have the maternal side of the placenta, mom's blood, and then you have the fetus side of blood and its blood vessels. They come close for diffusion, but they don't touch. They don't mix, kind of like a respiratory membrane. Okay, so then from the blastocyst, this is you know, the stage that we're gonna have implantation. We have what's called the three-week embryo. And we go, once we've had implantation, we have the three-week embryo. And the layers, you know, it develops what's called these three embryonic layers, an outer, a middle, and an inner. That's the reason why we have three tissue layers to so many things. You know, like um, three layers of muscle, three layers of nerves, three layers of, of uh, cardiac muscle, three layers to the blood vessels, three layers, three layers. So we have the endoderm. The endoderm becomes the linings of the digestive, respiratory systems, and even part of the urinary. The mesoderm is all your connective tissues, you know, all your connective tissues, muscle, bone, adipose, cartilages, dense irregular connective tissue, dense regular connective tissue. And the ectoderm becomes the skin and the nervous system. Right, then on the first month embryo, that model, you need to identify the chorionic villi, the amniotic sac, and the yolk sac. Right, so the chorionic villi becomes the fetal side of the placenta. The amniotic sac, becomes the amniotic fluid in sac that cushions, kind of insulates the fetus during development. And the yolk sac in early stages, just like the yolk of a chicken egg, provides nutrition. But soon after, this is the source of um, our early red blood cells, the early red blood cells. Okay. So this is looking at those models. You know, these are the different stages and things associated with those stages. And we're going to look at the models and apply it. In exercise five, it says embryologic events, quote unquote, are fertilization, implantation, and penetration. And then we have processes that we call differentiation, organogenesis, gastrulation, and cleavage. We kind of just backslash, throw together the events and processes. But I'll tell you that like a stage is generally like, you know, like stages when children, which, well, develop, you know, like the terrible twos. And, you know, you have these stages that, that exist for a while. But during this stage, these certain events are happening. Event is really like a single, maybe a short term event. And, it, and it's done. It happens once and it's done. Well, processes, you know, are something that's kind of work being worked on sometimes over not the entire duration of the of the um, of the stage, you know, but it's not a, just a singular brief event, you know, like organogenesis is the beginning and the development of all the organs, you know, well, that continues from you know, about day 21, all the way to, you know, development of birth, 
So processes can, you know, take a period of time, you know, but they're often associated and they may, may exclusively be associated between one stage to another. So this will make more sense when we look at the model. So don't panic because I have this all filled out for you. All right. So the first thing we have, we have a sperm, you know, approaching the egg. Mm -hmm. So when that happens, we have a model that represents the sperm working its way, you know, through the um, cumulus of forest to a secondary oocyte, and that is called penetration. Because it's trying to penetrate through those cells and bind to that uh, zona pellucida of the membrane. Mm -hmm. right. So the first you have penetration. And upon penetration, he <clears throat> said, so now that uh oh site can complete meiosis too, yay, you know, and produce that third polar body. Mm -hmm. So now mm, we have fertilization. So that is followed by fertilization. That is the mingling of the chromosomes of the sperm with the chromosomes of the female, restoring the 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs that it should have upon fertilization. And once those intermingle like that, it is called a zygote. Now it's a one-celled structure with 23 pairs or 46 individual chromosomes. And this is now where it all begins to really happen. Right? So from the zygote, right, from a one-celled structure, it goes through the cleavage process. And that is multiple replications or divisions, I should say, is it, it, it you know, it, it makes a carbon copy of the cell. So it's going to go through mitosis and create a carbon copy. So you start with one cell, goes through mitosis, and now you have two cells. And then it goes through mitosis and you have four cells, eight cells, 16 cells, 32 cells. But it never, the whole structure never gets larger. We talked about this in lecture. We said part of that zona pellucida now, you know, to the outside, it keeps it from getting very much larger. You have, you know, cell um, replication, but the overall structure doesn't get bigger. The cells inside get smaller and smaller and smaller because this is occurring while you're in the fallopian tube and you don't want to get to have the thing get too big and get blocked in the fallopian tube. So you stay the overall capsule kind of to it keeps it from getting too big, but the cells are replicating themselves. Mm. And if you produce this solid mass of cells called a morula, well, now it's getting very close to the entrance point of the fallopian tube into the uterus. Mm. And now it becomes, the cells start to differentiate. Mm. So it goes from being a solid mass of cells to cells kind of moving and differentiating and producing a fluid filled kind of end to it, kind of like what the, uh, the graphium follicle looked like with that fluid filled antrum, it looks very similar. And that is called a blastocyst. It will have an inner cell mass, it will have these trophoblastic cells with this fluid filled area in there, and that is a blastocyst. And now you have a structure that's capable of the next event, implantation. So now it's in the uterus, it's going to bore into the endometrium. That's called implantation. And while it's there, soon after you have what's called gastrulation, it will develop those three embryonic layers, right? an endoderm, a mesoderm, and an ectoderm. Right? Then it enters what's called the three-week embryo you know, um, stage and thereafter we have organogenesis. So it's right after, you know, we get to this, this gastrulation phase because we have to have these three germ layers. We very quickly start to develop organ systems. And the first one is the nervous system, right? So, you know, about day 21 to day 24, you start developing, you know, a brain and spinal cord. And that takes you to about, that takes about a week you know, other systems, you know, the nervous system starts developing first. We have, um, you know, red blood cells starting to be established. You're starting to establish, um, you know, a cardiovascular system, mm -hmm. but nervous system first. Right? And then we, that takes about a week and then we enter the one month embryo. 
and hereafter, all these organ systems to start, you know, working their way through um, developing over the course of the remaining um, eight months. And so we'll look at what we need to know on the first month embryo model. All right, so that's the end of filling out that page. Let me go back to the top and let me get into the images. So just be patient. Let me go down to lab button. And the images. Oh, yes, quiz. Okay, now we're there. Whew. All right, so. Here we're looking at identify the event or process. So we, there's a little, and, and my pictures in the notes show this really well also. What's on his fingertip at four, that's the tail of a sperm. And this represents a secondary oocyte with the corona radiata around it in those little gray nucleated cells. And then between that and the yellow portion of that secondary oocyte is a white layer. Um, this diagram, that is the zone of pellucida, all right? So we have the event, you know, or process is penetration. We have a secondary oocyte here in the center. It's waiting to complete meiosis two. Number, arrow number two is pointing to two, black number two on there. That is a zone of pellucida. One is pointing to the corona radiata and four is pointing to essentially the tail of the sperm. And it's called penetration. Corona radiata, zona pellucida, secondary oocyte, spermatozoa. It's actually a, a sperm at that point. Um, so those are 23 chromosomes each. It will restore the 46 total or 23 pairs. Okay, then you gotta flip this right side up. This represents a zygote. And that little white spot there, that represents the other polar body that's produced. So identify the event, the process, you know, and identify the stage. So the, uh, we've had, uh, the event is fertilization and the stage is a zygote stage. Right. Now we have total of 46 chromosomes. Okay, now we have a series of balls. We went from the zygote, which is one cell, and it divides into now two, and two to four, and four to eight. Those are the balls from left to right. That process of, you know, is called the cleavage process. And the last stage would be the morula stage. So the process is cleavage or cleavage process. We end with what's called the mole, it has the mulberry appearance. And you end with this. That's the morula. Now we said it's approaching the entrance point into the uterus. So it starts to have migration of cells. It uh, develops what's called an inner cell mass and trophoblastic cells and this fluid filled cavity, and that is a blastocyst. So here we have the, the gray cells to the outer periphery. And between that and one, that yellow cell mass, is a kind of a fluid filled cavity there. That becomes the amniotic, um, amniotic sac and fluid. So you kind of have to look at this in a continuum. It's, I, I must say it's easier when you see it in lab and you see them all in a row, you know, but we're going to try to simulate that. All right, so we have the blastocyst stage, inner cell mass becomes the embryo, and the trophoblast becomes the chorion, uh, the chorionic villi, and ultimately the placenta. 
this is where human chorionic and trophy comes from. All right, and then again here, we are now implanting. I'll just tell you, there's a theme here to color. You see where number seven is, which is like a, a red, but then below that is like that deep magenta kind of a color. And then you have the little pink cells there and the yellow cells there. All right. So the, that number seven, that medium color red, I guess you could say the red here, that is the endometrium. That's mom's side. Okay. Anything with that magenta to the pink cells, to the yellow cells, to the surface where it has like a little number one on those yellow cells, that is all fetus side, okay? And the mom side will continue to be that, that reddish layer there, number seven. And just so you kind of keep in mind, that is endometrium. That's what you're burrowing into. All right, so this is identify the process, the event, and the stage. So the event is implantation, okay? The stage is the blastocyst stage. And now very quickly, that dark magenta region is going to become the chorionic villi and the placenta. You can see a little red and blue in there. And then the pink to yellow is going to have what's called gastrulation and produce three different layers. And so it quickly becomes this structure. Over to the right-hand side, even though you, know, you can see those little blood vessels there, that's what the chorionic villi become and ultimately the fetal side of the placenta because you can see these little blood vessels are being established. And then we have this little uh, Fetus on a stalk, so to speak. This is going to develop and change to where it almost looks like a little developing chicken because everybody kind of looks the same at that stage of the game. But we have here, we have the little yellow region sack on the bottom. That's going to become the yolk sac. And it's no surprise that that layer to the bottom of the three layers here right through the center is yellow. And thus it acts to be the lining of the digestive system linings of the respiratory system, you know, and even parts of the urinary system, All right? So you have a yellow layer, a brown layer in between, I believe that is a number two, and then the pink layer on its back, right? endoderm in yellow, the brown layer in the middle is the mesoderm and the pink will be the ectoderm. So this event or process, Take a while is gastrulation that produces the three germ layers. And the stage is the three week stage. That's three week embryo. There is no neurola, there's no, it's just a three week embryo. All right, so blown up a little bit. Here we can see the pink layer on its back, that's the ectoderm, the brown layer in the middle, number two, uh, mesoderm, and three is the endoderm. All right, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. What are their fates? What do they become? The ectoderm becomes the epidermis of the nervous system in pink. Very yeah, good, you wrote that in there. Mesoderm is the brown layer. That is all the connective tissues, um, bone, muscle, um, that's regular connective tissue, your cartilages. And then the endoderm, or the, it becomes the inner linings, but inner linings of, all right, you know, it's not the inner linings of every single thing, it's the inner linings of the digestive system, the respiratory system, and parts of the urogenital, urogenitary system. Right, and then we get to our last model, here we have now, we can see to the outside, this little dude on a little stalk of material here with a yellow um, yolk sac. Here we have the embryo in pink and surrounding it in that white layer, um, that number one, I believe that's supposed to be what one is pointing to. And the black number four on it, that is the um, embryonic, uh, the, yeah, 
yeah, the saccharine fluid, the, the placenta, the placenta is to the right hand side in two, but the sac and fluid is here at four, and number three is a yolk sac. The yolk sac um, serves as a as an early source of nutrition, but not for very long. Um, it actually becomes a source of red blood cell production. So here we have the one month embryo, we have the amniotic sac and fluid, we have the chorionic villi, which becomes the placenta that produces HCG. Um, and uh, the amniotic sac, it, it does protect it. It protects from a couple different, uh, in a couple different ways, it helps actually um, temperature regulate quite well. Um, but it also keeps that developing fetus from rubbing on the walls because these tissues and cells have to move and migrate. It's kind of like making bread and you roll out, you know, when you, or even if you just roll out, you roll out maybe your dough and then you might fold it and twist it and punch it down and let it rise and then pull it apart and twist it and turn it, you know, and let it rise again. You know, that's kind of the analogy of how you embryologically develop. Uh, and the yolk sac is, is nutrients at an early stage, but it actually is a red blood cell source. So make sure you use, you know, essentially what we used, um, the PowerPoint notes that I provided you and the, um, and filling in those exercises because a lot of these are just kind of very basic um, descriptions, you know, of um, what these models are. And then the instructor, of course, takes it to their own level. We're gonna quick go back to the PowerPoints also because those almost 99% of the time are very good sources to study from. So here we have one of those cookie sheet models. I was telling you that to the interior region, um, the little cycle here is for the ovaries. So you have you know A to B to C, uh, and then down here you have ovulation, and then F and G. If you could see, if you had backed up and taken this picture, do you see right below, well, kind of F here, um, there's a little cycle number. You have like a number 14 here in black, just above ovulation. That's telling you the days in the ovarian cycle that you're looking at. You can't quite see it up at 12 o'clock, but that should say 28. So you had then, you know, one, two, three, four, five, the, you know, the first two weeks, you know, that occur in the ovaries to day 14, which is ovulation, and then day 15 to 28, but it's been kind of obscured. But you have, you know, A to B, this is all the follicular cells, you know, up until day 14 um, and uh, follicular phases, follicle stimulating hormones, stimulating this process, A, B to C here. That's a primary follicle to a secondary follicle to a graphium mature follicle, right? And then it gets larger and ruptures. So you can see the release of that secondary oocyte. And the material that stays behind becomes E to F, um, a corpus luteum, right? Luteinizing hormone stimulates that event at day 14, that ovulation, and stimulates these phases F through G, these luteal stages, because we're using luteinizing hormone. And that corpus luteum is secreting estrogen and progesterone. Some instructors will use, they'll just point to a day and they'll say, what uterine phase is it? Honestly, I think it's easier to look at the phases out in the corners around the periphery, mm. but you could use this, you know, what is the, so essentially you have, remember the uterus is going to have menses, the proliferative phase and, phase and the secretory phase. So the first five days are going from essentially 12 o'clock to about 2.30 in red there on clock face. So that would be menses. Then that's followed and just go in order. You know, we had the proliferative phase. So that would be what's happening um, between the end of menstruation and to just about day 14. And then from there on from ovulation all the way up in yellow, that's your secretory phase. So in the purple, in the proliferative phase, we would have estrogen, 
heavy estrogen, and then in yellow, progesterone. Okay. Know your hormones. Right. These are some pictures of a one month or embryo in the two month. I only go as far as a one month and I don't use those models. So I'm just gonna skip over that. I try to keep it a little simple for you. So we use the same models all the time. Okay, so I'm going to quick switch back to my notes, the PowerPoints that are up there and let me reshare. And it won't take much longer, folks, so just hold on. Okay, so this is what we were just looking at, these phases in the center. Now, I think it's easier to look at the um, uh, uterine phases to the periphery. So over A, you know, in the upper right-hand corner, what's happening in the uterus? Menstruation. And then we have the next picture in the lower right-hand side that represents the proliferative phase. We have ovulation at C, and then to the lower left-hand side, to the upper uh, left-hand side. And that is the days about 15 to 28. That is the secretory phase, and that is due to progesterone. So let me just go back, because that would, I think I'm gonna modify these later with putting the hormones next to them because you know here we have um, the ovarian cycle in the center and the uterine cycle to the outside. So starting again above A to the upper right hand side, if you want to look at the uterine cycle, that is menses, and then down the uterus in the lower right hand side between B and C, that would be the uh, proliferative stage estrogen, and then between C and DDD to the lower left-hand side to the upper left-hand side, we had the secretory phase with progesterone. Okay, this again is just those hormones that I showed you before, production site target and action. We're looking at some more models. Again, events and processes versus stages. This is what we had, I had filled in for you. And these are just extra pictures too. And I'd like to use these because these are big. So here we have the sperm tail here. We have the secondary oocyte. We have a corona radiata and a zona pellucida. And this event you know, is penetration. Right? So, oh, yeah. so I tell you here, right? The event is penetration up on top. C is the corona radiata. Um, B is the secondary oocyte and A is the sperm. C would be those cells up on the top, right? The white layer, actually number two is, is its own pellucida, but I think I give you a different picture. So hold on, which is this one, yay. All right, so this is from um, like the upper left-hand corner of one of the reproduction big plastic cookie sheet models we looked at in the reproduction lab. Right? And I like this because it's huge. <laughs> so this is what you would ovulate. In the center, B here, that's your secondary oocyte, you know, that just got ovulated, it's traveling down the fallopian tubes. The green layer there represents the zona pellucida, and the fluffy mass of cells on the surface, A, is the corona radiata. So it tells you up here, A, corona radiata, the innermost layer of the cumulus oophorus, it's called, and is directly adjacent to the zona pellucida, protective layer of the ovum and a physical barrier to sperm. The zona pellucida is that green layer. It says glycoprotein membrane surrounding the plasma membrane of an oocyte containing receptors for sperm. You know, so this will help to you know, um, allow only one sperm to enter into this oocyte and render it impermeable. Okay, so then we have, you have penetration on the left-hand side and now the zygote after penetration. So penetration, it's BCD is referring to the letters B, C, and D on the model to the left-hand side. And then A, that it represents a zygote because fertilization is occurring here. All 
All right, then we go from A, the zygote stage, right? We start there and now we start to have this cleavage process and we go from one cell to two cells to four cells to eight. Just, do you see how the overall size never changes? Right, so it doesn't get caught in the fallopian tube, essentially. And then as we get closer to the, um, um, well, I'll, let me just back up and just say at the end of the cleavage process, even though it doesn't change size, that stage is called the morula stage. So that is that A down below, it's a mass of solid cells, mass of solid morula stage. But now as it approaches the uterus, it needs to have um, differentiation of cells. So it becomes, we, we go from being a solid mass of cells to the trophoblastic cells to the outer periphery B and the yellow mass here at C. And then you have a fluid filled cavity. So B and D develop into the trophoblastic cells that eventually become the chorion, the chorionic villi in the placenta, the fetal side of the placenta. And C becomes the inner cell mass, which ultimately becomes the fetus. So now it travels in, it is now traveled into at this point as the blastocyst into the uterus and implants and burrows into the endometrium, right? So the event is implantation. A is identifying the endometrium. I'm sorry, A is the trophoblast, B is the endometrium. I was gonna say, I, I'm, I'm looking at one thing and I'm reading it, but something else is coming out of my mouth, my bad. Because that B is the medium light reddish area, so that will always be the endometrium a mom's endometrium, and that more darker magenta color is the fetal side. Right, so A is the trophoblast that ultimately becomes the fetal side of the placenta, and then C is the inner cell mass. Inner cell mass is an early source of nutrition and early source of red blood cells. Okay, so it implants, and now it quickly, you start to see migration of these cells to produce these three germ layers. This stage is the three week embryo stage. You know, there really is no neurola stage. I think this became adopted. It was something on a pamphlet that came with it or something. But if you even Google that, they're really not gonna, they don't generally refer to it as a neurola stage, it's a three week embryo. Right? What are these, you know, what are the layers and what is the developmental state, you know, or the developmental fate, I should say. All right, so here we have layer A in pink, B in brown. All right, that dotted line should be shifted a little bit lower. And C is the yellow layer. Ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Ectoderm is skin and nervous system. Um, B is muscle, bone, all the connective tissues, fat, hyaline cartilage, so forth. Spongy bone, compact bone, blah, blah, blah. And C are the inner linings you know, of your respiratory and digestive systems. And then actually part of the, the urinary. Uh, okay, here's our three week embryo, arguably neurola stage and the one month embryo. So it goes from a three week embryo over to the left hand side. And now you can see the chorionic villi, you know, B is pointing to uh, the chorionic villi on both of these models, right? So here we have the chorionic villi at B being established, you know, during that three week to four week portion. And now when it's at about four weeks, look how well established it is. It has a significant amount of chorionic villi here, penetrating deeper and deeper into the endometrium and to the outside layer, you can see that lighter red layer to it. You had the fetus here at A, you know, you have the amniotic sac and fluid surrounding and protecting it. You know, and then you have D, the yolk sac. All right, and so that is it for the, um, the models and things. I think you'll find that uh, even after the quiz, the, the questions are pretty straightforward. Okay, and so, all right, well, that is it then. That is the end. I'm going to break this share and stop the recording.
The next lab is uh, the inheritance lab. Um, again, not too complicated, just a lot of terminology, really. Uh, maybe takes about, I don't know, an hour and a half. All right, that is it. Thank you.